Good morning or good afternoon, depending on, on where you're joining from today. Uh, my name is Emma Feeney. I'm an assistant professor at UCD's Institute of Food and Health. And for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to speak to you about some work that we've done on the cheese matrix and impacts on heart health outcomes. And so I'd just like to start by saying thank you to the organisers for the invitation to speak to you all today and for the chance to disseminate some of this work. So thank you. And just to highlight my disclosures here. So we've heard already today from Dr. Halsher on the effects of the food matrix. And again here I'd like to reiterate that point. So this diagram on the left uh, by Hoffman in 2003 shows how the different levels for studying diet and there are different levels on which we can study health. So we can study the overall diet itself, we can break it into, gr into different food groups, into food items, or we can look at the individual nutrients. When we study health, likewise, we have a number of levels as well. And with a reductionist approach, when we study the links between diet and health, often we are studying individual nutrients and their association with a single health biomarker. And we can lose then some of the important information on the links between diet and health. And this is particularly true for dairy foods. So dairy foods are well recognized for their nutrients and particularly calcium, which we know to be important for bone health. And again, this figure just really nicely demonstrates how when we focus on the links between the food constituents and the markers of intake, we can miss those true effects of diet and health. One of the important effects is the effect of the food matrix. And this figure by Aguilera in 2019 is a really nice overview of how the food matrix can result in differences in digestion and assimilation of nutrients. So if we look at the top left part of this figure, we can see that the nutrients are represented there by the black dots and they are present in the food in a particular matrix and, uh, and that food has a particular microstructure. So the interaction of that food and the matrix in which it is eaten affects the bioaccessibility then of the nutrient and the bioavailability of the nutrient. So we can see that the food matrix in which a nutrient is consumed can affect the overall digestion and absorption of those nutrients. And this is just a really nice demonstration of food matrix effects. Okay, so now that we've you know introduced that concept of the reductionist approach to the links between diet and health, and we've also talked about food matrix effects um, from different foods. I want to move on now and talk about a little bit about some of the, the evidence to date for different dairy products um, on different health outcomes. And so the figures that you can see here on this slide are from a recent meta-analysis by Jakobsen et al. in 2021. And you can see that they looked at a range of different dairy products um, and, and compared uh, their impact on different health outcomes. On this particular slide here, these ones were focused on coronary heart disease and risk of ischemic stroke. And so we can see um, that they've done two things. They've looked at milk overall, and you can see that on the left-hand side. And then over on the right-hand side, you can see that they've actually divided the milk out into low-fat milk and high-fat milk. And so we can also see uh, when we look at milk overall, um, there was really no, no effect and you can see that, that that blue diamond at the bottom, which is an overall summary of the different studies, is very much in the middle of that risk ratio. But then if we look over on the right hand side, we can see actually that um, while low fat milk does appear to be neutral, when they divide them into low fat and high fat milk, we can see that actually with high fat milk, that blue diamond is falling to the right hand side of that line in the middle, which would indicate that there is a risk um, of high fat milk consumption and uh, increased risk of coronary heart disease and ischemic stroke. So the high fat milk did, see, uh, did show an association in this meta-analysis. Then if we look further at the risks, um, and this time considering for cheese consumption, we can see here that overall cheese was actually associated with a reduced risk of stroke, and it was slightly protective for coronary heart disease. 
But again, when they divided that out into low-fat cheese, we can see that it was neutral overall, but that there was a lot of heterogeneity in those results. So again, what this is demonstrating is you know, the importance of not just considering dairy foods as a whole, but considering those individual dairy products. And you know, this can be quite difficult sometimes to do with a lot of these studies because um, there's a number of reasons. There's difficulties with the data. As we all know, food consumption data can be quite unreliable. Um, but also, it's not always collected in such a way to allow those individual foods to be examined. So for example, sometimes with food frequency questionnaires, uh, they tend to group all of the dairy foods together. It is interesting that we are consistently seeing cheeses as being um, beneficial or associated with a, a reduced risk of ischemic heart disease and stroke in so many of these studies now. Um, and one potential reason uh, for this may be due to the vitamin K content. So cheese is a source of vitamin K2. And um, you can see here that you know it can be affected very much by a range of different factors that can affect K2 levels in cheese. So vitamin K2 has been associated with uh, decreased vascular calcification and so this is one potential hypothesis around why we, we see these um, continually these association studies that do suggest a reduced risk of coronary heart disease and ischemic stroke with cheese consumption. And so the key point that I want to make here is that dairy foods are not all the same and so really we shouldn't be treating them um, as a group as a whole whenever we look to those links between diet and health. And so this is just a really nice table from Thorning et al. in 2017 um, that just gives you a really clear overview of some of the key differences between, again, some generic um, different dairy products. So it has summarized cheese, two types of milk, yogurt, cream and butter. Again, th this is a very simplistic overview. We know that you know they differ even more than this. Um, but really what this is highlighting is that these different dairy products, they differ hugely in terms of their calcium and their phosphorus uh, content. They also differ hugely in terms of their protein content. So for example, cheeses will contain only casein, whereas some of the other dairy products will, will contain a mixture of whey and casein, and then cream and butter will have no protein in there. Um, the overall fat structure is quite different as well. So some of them, for example, will be made from homogenized milk and they'll uh, be quite different then to products that have been made from non-homogenized milk. And then also the protein networks are very different as well. So even within cheese, cheeses can have a solid or a viscoelastic protein network, depending on whether it's a hard or a soft cheese. Uh, milk will have a liquid network and then yogurts will have a gel or a viscoelastic network as well. So, so many um, structural differences there, fat content differences and protein content differences as well. And so it makes sense then that these different dairy products can actually all result in quite different health effects. And again, there is quite a lot of evidence now for cheese as having beneficial effects, um, both on markers of heart health, as we've mentioned, and also on metabolic health. And it does seem as if some of these effects do appear to be due to the particular overall matrix of cheese itself. And so within UCD, we designed a study to test the effect of that cheese matrix. And for this particular study, we were interested in the effect of the saturated fat content on markers of heart health and how important it was that that fat should be maintained within the cheese matrix. So we conducted a study in an over 50s population. They had a BMI of 25 or over. Um, we gave them 42 grams of fat in three different dairy matrices. So they either received all of their fat in the form of a full fat cheese, which you can see down at the bottom left, group A. Um, some of them received their fat in the form of a reduced fat cheese plus butter, and that's group B. And then group C received a broken down form, so it was their fat was none of their fat was in the matrix of cheese. They were given butter, a calcium supplement, and they were also given a, a calcium caseinate powder. So we tried to match as closely as we could the fat, calcium, and the protein content, 
Um, and then also we had a fourth group of people who um, essentially followed the same diet as group A, full fat cheese, but they first completed a six week run in where they removed all cheese from their diet before going on to the cheese diet. And so here you can see the results from that study. Um, on the left hand side you can see the results for the total cholesterol and then in the middle you can see the HDL cholesterol and then on the right that's the results for the LDL cholesterol. And on this bar chart we have plotted the change from baseline. So we can see that there was a reduction overall in total cholesterol for groups A, B and C. Um, then the other two bars that you see are the two visits for group D. So the visit after they had removed all cheese from their diet, we see a small increase. And then once they had gone on to the same diet as group A, uh, we see that decrease then uh, after that six weeks. So overall, there was a decrease in total cholesterol. Um, no change really in the HDL cholesterol. You can see that in the middle. So if we look then on the right hand side, we can see that all of that change in total cholesterol was very much driven by changes in LDL cholesterol. And what I want to highlight here on, on these um, bars is that group A uh, had, had a significant reduction in their LDL cholesterol compared to groups B and C. So they experienced the greatest reduction in, in both total and LDL cholesterol was observed when, when the people consumed all of their fat within the matrix of cheese. And so more recently, we've done some work to look at those individual responses to those diets. Um, and this work has been led by our postdoc in our group, uh, Dr. Erin O'Connor. And you can see on the left hand side here um, that there was considerable variation in the overall responses. So this is everyone's change plotted uh, in their total cholesterol. And you can see that it was possible then to, to group people into turtiles based on their individual response. And so Aileen grouped people into turtiles one, two, and three, um, just even, even groups uh, based on their overall response. And then on the right-hand side, you can see that we have plotted those turtiles of response uh, onto the different diets. So group A was the cheese diet, group B was the reduced fat cheese and butter diet, and then group C was the broken down form, so the butter and the calcium caseinate powder and the supplement. And what we can see here is that while there is definitely a food matrix effect, so we do see, for example, there in the full fat cheese group, we do see that yes, those those people that are in that highest turtle of response, that more of them are in group A um, and in group B, and then there's much fewer of them in group C, which, which we would expect. But we do see that there is, that, you know, there are also people in group A who, who didn't respond or who went up in terms of their cholesterol. There's more of them in group C, um, but we do see we do see these differences across the groups. And so we wanted to try and identify then um, whether or not there were characteristics of people who would who would be what we would classify as a responder or not. So here then we can see that Aileen has compared the people in Turtiles 1 and Turtiles 3 for their baseline characteristics. And so on these two diagrams here on the left hand side, um, those people have been classified based on their change in their total cholesterol. And on the right hand side, they've been classified into turtiles based on their change in LDL cholesterol. So two slightly different uh, turtile groups there. But in both groups, what we can see is that there are significant differences at baseline between turtiles 1 and turtiles 3 for a range of fasting lipids. So total cholesterol, HDL and LDL were all different um, as well as triacylglycerides. And so what this is telling us really is that um, those baseline levels as well are also very predictive of who will respond best to these high fat diets. So yes, there's certainly a food matrix effect where we did see that there was, an, there was a strong influence of the cheese matrix, but we also see that actually the people who might benefit the most from cheese um, are those people with those higher starting total and LDL cholesterol levels. But of course, um, as we now know as well, you know, fasting LDL and total cholesterol levels don't tell us the whole story. 
So within the LDL cholesterol, um, the particle size may actually be more indicative of the CVD risk than the LDL cholesterol level alone. And so here on this figure, this is just um, showing how two people could theoretically have the same overall level of LDL cholesterol. So both of these people have 130 milligrams per deciliter of LDL cholesterol, but you can see that it's held in very different particle sizes. And so this could be due to you know, a number of different reasons. It could be the fat quality rather than the quantity or, or the food matrix. It could be lots of different things um, that potentially affect these particle sizes. And so we were interested then to look into this in more detail as well. And so these figures then are showing um, some data from one of the PhD students in the group, Simone Dunn who has been really focusing on the particle size and changes in particle size distribution from, from this same study. Um, I suppose not to go into these in a crazy amount of detail, but just I suppose to highlight that she has looked at uh, different particle sizes within the LDL particles. So she's divided them, she's looked at the total LDL particles and then she's divided them into large, intermediate um, and small LDL particles. And then I'll just show you on the next slide. And what she's seeing then is that there is a very strong correlation between the changes in total uh, LDL particles and VLDL particles. So she sees this um, not only for the total population, but she sees it right across the different food matrices as well. And what these correlations are indicating then is a general move towards um, less atherogenic profiles overall. So those changes are being driven by, by movements towards a, a less atherogenic profile. So the, the changes in the, in the smallest particles are very, very strongly correlated, which indicates that those reductions that we see in the VLDL particles are driven by the smaller particles. And again, as I say, that's, that's quite similar actually for each of the diets. So we, we didn't see huge differences across the different food matrices there. So moving on then to try and understand a little bit, um, you, you know, what might be driving some of these different effects that we see um, and what is it that's sort of special about the cheese matrix. We were quite interested in calcium um, and testing then the effect of changing calcium within a cheese matrix to see whether or not that might impact um, either LDL cholesterol levels or the primary objective of this study was to look at um, fecal fat excretion. And that's because there had been a few studies to suggest that the reason that we see some of these differences, because yeah, there have been a few studies now that show those differences between cheese and butter for, for fasting LDL cholesterol levels. And so some of the studies had suggested that this was due to differences in fecal fat excretion that could be driven by the calcium content of cheese. So within this study, we, um, we had some specially made cheeses by our colleagues down in Chagask. And they, they basically just, during the process of making natural cheese, they naturally reduced down the calcium content of some of the cheese, that, uh, of one cheese, and they naturally increased the calcium content of another cheese. So we had a reduced calcium cheese of 550 five milligrams per 100 grams of cheese. Um, and then we had a high calcium cheese, and so that cheese contained 897 milligrams of calcium per 100 grams of cheese. And then we had a control group who also were given the reduced calcium cheese and a calcium supplement to bring them up to the same overall amount of calcium as that high calcium cheese diet. And so this table is just an overview of, of those uh, compositions in total. And we're showing it here for 100 gram portions, but we actually gave people 240 grams of cheese a day for two weeks in this study. So here you can see just a really brief overview of the overall design for that calcium study. So the volunteers, um, we had in total, we had seven people who completed the study in total. We were aiming for 10, but it was quite difficult to get people to stay in the study. And then also uh, we weren't able to recruit further people afterwards because 
of the fact that the cheeses had been specially made and matured for this study. Um, but you can see that they spent two weeks uh, on a high calcium cheese, they spent two weeks on a low calcium cheese and they also spent two weeks on a low calcium cheese plus the calcium supplement. All of their other food was given to them for the, during the course of this study um, and they completed a five day fecal collection during each of those periods and they also completed a 24 hour urine collection as well and uh, and then these um, the, the dietary periods were randomized as well um, so the results of that study were, were published recently in the European Journal of Nutrition and here you can see that our primary outcome which was uh, fecal fat excretion that we didn't actually see differences in the faecal fat excretion in terms of uh, when it was expressed as grams per day. Now we did see differences in the faecal fat excretion when it was expressed as a percentage, um, but the it was actually the reduced calcium cheese plus the supplement group who had the highest faecal fat percentage uh, there. What we didn't expect to see was that we actually saw a reduction in LDL cholesterol um, so post-intervention, fasting LDL cholesterol was lower in the high calcium cheese group compared to the other two arms of the study. Um, and we weren't expecting to see that at all because they were, really, they were only on the uh, interventions for two weeks and they were young healthy males as well. So, so that was an unexpected result. Um, it does potentially point to you know something else in the matrix uh, since the calcium excretion was actually higher after the calcium supplement group. Um, it didn't appear to be supported by the faecal fat excretion results although I should point out here that we did only have seven people who completed that study and again that was just due to quite high dropout rates um, and it wasn't possible to recruit further people to the study because of the fact that, that those cheeses were specifically made. Um, but again it does appear to point to a specific matrix effect for cheese and so again this is something that we would like to look into a little bit further at some point in the future. And so here on the left hand side you can see a figure where we've really just tried to pull together some of those different um, effects within the cheese matrix that may be leading to some of these differences that we see. So we can see here some of the different factors that affect how the cheese matrix is digested and absorbed from the initial processing conditions, so the milk composition, the pretreatment, the manufacturing process, the ripening, right through to the food preparation, to oral processing, and then through to digestion and absorption. And again, so coming back then to this link between diet and health, you know, it is important as we continue to look at, you know, some of the, the different products and their links to health outcomes. Um, it is important that I suppose first of all that we do collect that information and to the level that we need um, but also we do want to try and understand more about how that preparation process before consumption can actually impact health as well. So we actually have, have a study that's just finishing up at the moment um, where we've been looking at the effect of melting cheese before consumption to see if that is something that will also impact that overall food matrix and some of those food matrix effects that we see from cheese as well. So thank you very much for listening and also thank you to the people listed here, the Cheese Study team and the wider FHI team and our past Cheese Study member team members as well. Um, I'd be more than happy to chat to any of you about any of these studies if you'd like any more information on them. My email address is there. Um, and then finally, just uh, thank you so much to the organisers for the opportunity to speak to you all today and to disseminate this work. Thank you.